Welcome to Earthenkind Quests. My name is Mike, and this video is about making better monsters in Dungeons & Dragons, in terms of making the monster encounters unique and memorable. I will share examples about ogres as a popular kind of monster that could fit into many different environments, themes, and settings. In this video, I start with accepting that you already decided that ogres play a role in your adventure, and here I will guide through some ideas about how to make your ogres unique and memorable. My number one tip is to represent each monster as an individual. This advice feels like a tired old cliché, but it works. Most importantly, you do not need to invest hours or days of your time, as I will demonstrate within the minutes of this video. If an ogre is threatening a village, then the people call it THE Ogre, or they may give it a name such as the Bone Crusher, the Mountain Menace, or the Fury of the Forest. If your setting involves a group of ogres, then what is the name of the group? Who is the leader? Who might be competing for leadership? How can the individuals be differentiated? By their rank or status? Their jobs within the group? Or their reputations? You do not need to answer all of these questions at the beginning. Usually in my games, I will prepare a few rudimentary notes, but I will wait to make formal decisions only if or when they will become relevant. One key question that I always ask is about what the monster wants. Does an ogre want to find food to eat? A new place to live? Or something else? Are two different family lineages of ogre competing for a hereditary title? Who might be the allies? Who might be the enemies? The answers to these questions will depend on what you will want to happen in your game or adventure. Again, typically I start with a few basic notes, and then I will add more details later as the story will develop. Whether I am working with ogres or goblins or another kind of monster, I like to be prepared with a few random tables. One set of tables can be about possible names of individuals for whenever a name might be needed. Another set of tables can be about how to describe the physical appearance of the individual as larger or smaller than others, wearing a certain kind of clothing or armor, or carrying a tool, a weapon, or something else. In most cases, just one point is enough to differentiate the individuals, and I could add more points if someone will ask for more details or if the situation will call for it. Similarly, I like to be prepared with a few options about a personality trait or a behavioral characteristic that can add to the individuality. Players will remember when their characters met an ogre with a pet chicken, when they encountered a goblin obsessed with her fashionable haircut, or when they fought against a gelatinous cube that yawned and stretched before every time that it moved. You can work with the many random tables that already exist in Dungeons & Dragons officially or in independent content, as well as in other game systems. I like to modify these lists and add my own ideas that fit within the particular setting. Even if you will want to invest in more of your own time for your own creative input, then the vast majority of the workload is front-loaded and only once followed by possibly adding little amounts of updates and minor adjustments later if you may want to do so. Among the most fun for me personally is the practice of reskinning, changing the theme, or breaking the standard lore about a monster. When I want to make ogres unique in my setting, then I might call them by a different name. Once again, random tables can be helpful for making these kinds of decisions. Maybe I will describe the ogre creatures as large-sized humanoid hulks of lizard folk, tree folk, cat folk, fish folk, or another lineage. I might add a climb speed or a swim speed, an amphibious feature, or another trait that makes an ogre different and interesting. For the monsters that use armor, weapons, and other items, I prepare a simple list of gear. I understand that a similar approach will be in the next official monster manual in 2025. In my version, I mentioned that an ogre typically carries a great club, a packet of six javelins, and a sack. The great club could be described as a broken tree trunk, a bundle of tree branches, a slab of stone, a giant clamshell, a horn or a limb bone from a large beast that lives in the region, or a piece from a castle door, a bridge, or a portcullis. The javelins could be smaller versions of those items. 
The sack could contain an ogre-sized handful of mushrooms, a collection of colorful or smooth rocks, pointy bones for cleaning the ogre's teeth after a meal, or uprooted bushes of scented flower to use as perfume. Sometimes I might add a treasure item as a reward for the characters mixed in with the ogre's usual belongings. I prepare a few ideas about an ogre's motivations, potentially useful during the social encounters. In most cases, an ogre would be indifferent about these interactions or would be easily provoked into a hostile confrontation. I like to consider an ogre's motivations to defend its territory and its extended family. Perhaps some ogres were displaced from their homeland or felt threatened by a forest fire or an avalanche, by a regional war, or by more powerful creatures moving into their territory. In most game settings, encounters with ogres will involve combat at one point or another. An ogre with a particular type of javelin might prefer to attack from a safe range, while most others probably would run into hand-to-hand -hand melee combat as soon as they could do so. Maybe one ogre happens to be unarmed, preferring to push enemies, knock them prone, or grapple and restrain them. Maybe an unarmed ogre can grab a nearby rock or a piece of furniture that functions as if it were a great club. With the new 2024 rules, I may consider about adding a weapon mastery. Some but not all ogres would apply the push mastery with a great club or the slow mastery with a javelin. For more individuality, I might describe one ogre differently, using a spiked club that delivers piercing damage and can apply the sap weapon mastery. Another ogre might use a tree trunk with a broad bladed edge embedded into it, delivering slashing damage and bringing the cleave mastery. Perhaps another ogre wields a giant octopus tentacle or the spinal column of a large beast, functioning as a whip with extra reach, delivering bludgeoning damage and adding the slow weapon mastery. In most cases, I will change the damage type and apply a different weapon mastery, but I will not change the amount of damage from the standard Ogre's Great Club at 13 or 2 die 8 plus 4. If I will want to increase an ogre's damage output per round, then I will add an extra attack. If I will want to give more defensive power to one ogre or to a group of ogres, then I might describe that an ogre carries an entire castle door or a large chunk of a castle wall as a shield, adding to the armor class and doubling as the equivalent of the ogre's great club weapon. Maybe an ogre wears scraps of metal scavenged from fallen adventurers. Perhaps an ogre naturally is protected by unusually thick or rough skin with horny nodules, an outer shell, or an anatomy made of stone or tree bark. Most of these cases can add plus two to the armor class, but you could consider a higher bonus. For the ogres without an extra armor class protection, perhaps they prefer to stay at range to throw javelins or rocks. I might give them the equivalent of a sharpshooter feat to ignore the penalties of long range, of aiming through half or three quarters cover, and throwing a weapon when an enemy is within five feet. Another option is for one ogre to be a shaman with limited spellcasting features. I might increase the wisdom or another ability score slightly, but primarily the ogre shaman will cast spells that do not depend on the spellcasting ability modifier. The shaman could cast Bless, Healing Word, or Fog Cloud. The shaman could make creative use of cantrips such as Thaumaturgy or Minor Illusion. If I will want for the shaman to bring more spellcasting power, then I would need to increase the spellcasting ability score in order to be effective with spells such as Command, Sanctuary, and Tangle, or Spike Growth. Yet another option involves animal companions or possible mounts. For large-sized creatures such as ogres, any mounts would need to be huge size or larger, such as with a dinosaur or a mammoth, and then the challenge rating would become imbalanced. For these reasons with ogres, I would reserve a huge-sized mount for a singular ogre boss. Otherwise, typically I will add beast companions that are not mounts, but rather that act as hunting partners in the wild or as guards at the lair. I will use the game statistics of a saber-toothed tiger, a giant lizard, a giant toad, a constrictor snake, or a giant vulture. I might describe these animals differently, just like I might describe the ogres differently. 
Whether acting as mounts or not, most animal companions can bring extra mobility on the battlefield. Depending on the environment, the mobility advantage could be magnified with climbing, swimming, burrowing, or flying. In all of these cases, the animal companions add to the total numbers of combatants, attacks per round, pool of hit points, and potential battlefield control. If I will anticipate that monsters will need more hit points, then I allow for the shaman, or perhaps an object in the environment, to generate a shield of temporary hit points. I rarely would use this approach with ogres because they already benefit from large numbers of hit points. Rather, a shield of temporary hit points can help to fortify some of the lower challenge rating monsters, such as kobolds or goblins, essentially upgrading them into a higher challenge rating. In most cases, I describe the shield of temporary hit points as a singular event of magic wielded by a shaman or another spellcaster, granting 5, 10, or maybe 20 temporary hit points to the spellcaster, and possibly to allies within a limited range of 5, 15, or 30 feet. Beyond these parameters, a temporary hit point shield can create balance problems in an encounter. Generally, in my approach, I consider how much damage that a group of characters typically will deliver in one round of combat, and then I adjust accordingly with a temporary hit point shield. Similarly, I might consider to add a limited ability for regeneration of hit points, such as how a troll can regenerate some hit points at the start of its turn unless it has taken acid or fire damage since its last turn. I will consider 2, 5, or 10 hit points to regenerate, and I will consider what type of damage might be able to bypass or prevent the regeneration, such as using a silvered weapon, radiant damage, or whatever else makes logical sense for the particular monster and the setting. In my games, I prefer to use hit point regeneration for the monsters that otherwise are described with the resistance or immunity to non-magical attacks. I understand that this type of resistance or immunity no longer will be popular in the forthcoming 2025 Monster Manual, yet for now the problems still exist. In any case, a limited regeneration feature can provide a fun extra element of problem solving and uniqueness in the encounters. Additionally, a damage vulnerability can be fun for the characters to discover, and mechanically, a vulnerability could offset the higher challenge of the regeneration ability. In a boss fight type of encounter, I might allow for a layer action on initiative count 20 to empower a repeating shield of temporary hit points or a regeneration of hit points. In these cases, something in the environment of the layer is responsible for the ongoing effect, such as a pool of magical water or slime, a set of statues or pillars, or an arcane altar or runestone. In any such case, the characters should be allowed to see what is happening and to learn how to disable or dismantle the effect. Possibly the empowering source involves a few minions of the boss fight monster, and one of them needs to sacrifice itself in order to absorb the damage that the boss fight monster otherwise might have taken, or to activate a legendary resistance for the boss monster. In any monster encounter, but especially in a boss fight or in a lair, I like to add environmental effects or hazards. A place might be equipped with pit traps, falling nets, or pressure plates that activate poison darts. Large trees, rock formations, steep slopes, dense foliage, ice or snow, pools of water or quicksand, and cracks in the ground can create natural obstacles, potentially blocking movement, presenting a slipping or falling hazard, or creating slower movement through difficult terrain. The characters or monsters with climbing speed, swimming speed, jumping ability, or similar features can be creative to take advantage of the environment. A higher challenge might involve pools of lava or acid, animated vines or other plants, or patches of brown mold or green slime. Perhaps random dice rolls can decide if a swamp gas or a steam vent will become flammable, if a sinkhole will open in the ground, or if a piece of a cave ceiling will tumble down. In nearly all of these cases, the monsters already will know about the environmental factors, and they will be prepared to act accordingly. Potentially, characters can scout or investigate in advance with the possibility of making preparations. 
As you may have noticed, the examples here mostly have been about ogres, but you could modify for your choice of monsters and your game setting. I have used this same approach not only with ogres, but also with kobolds, goblins, trolls, and many other monsters. In the comment section, I will be curious to know about your ideas and experiences with making monster encounters unique and memorable. As always, thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.